everyone, thank you for the patience in the, the waiting for the uh, technical problems. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm from Guatemala. I did my master's here uh, with uh, John Blake and Eric Hilgren in wildlife and uh, ecology, wildlife ecology and conservation that you have. And uh, after I graduated, I started working with uh, Dr. Christina Romagosa as a project manager in her research with uh, invasive pythons in South Florida. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, the research that I've been doing in Guatemala for a few years now. And uh, it's about the interactions between uh, native predators and uh, invasive prey. And um, so I'm gonna present you my results from my thesis and my ideas for the future. So we know that uh, communities are a set of biotic and abiotic uh, groups that interact between each other. Uh, the changes in one uh, trophic level or in, in one link will uh, affect the rest of the, of the system. And uh, that includes like a process of uh, extinctions or colonizations or invasions. Um, we know uh, this is like a textbook example of uh, how changing one link changes the whole system. And is when the extirpation of the sea waters happen in the Pacific of North America, the kelp forest uh, collapsed and uh, the regeneration of the kelp was really hard. After the reintroduction and the recovery of the populations, the kelp forest has been recovering uh, due to the predations that the sea waters do in sea orch or, or Orchins. <laughs> uh, well, invasions is uh, and the relations of uh, predator prey is not something new, but uh, is something that is mainly being focused on uh, invasive predators. One example uh, that is uh, highly studied in, in UF is the pythons. I'm also part of one project of those. And uh, one example that we have here is an experiment that a professor did here in, in UF and how the declines of populations of uh, marsh rabbit is associated with the presence of invasive pythons. And this is one example of many that we have in literature. But what happened when we have invasive prey? And this is uh, only recently, there's been uh, a few papers that is coming out. Another example that also from a professor here at UF is how the snail kites are taking advantage of the new resources of the invasive um, apple snail. The apple snail is a snail that is bigger in size uh, than the native one. And uh, is a previous research, they associated that it was hard for the, for the snail kites to handle this big prey. But they have shown that it's also associated now with uh, increase in population, in population sizes, and also in the is, is uh, shaping the distribution of the snail kite. And it's been gone as far as changing and uh, pushing evolution in this species because the, the beak of the snail kite is growing, uh, that is uh, allowing the snail kite to prey on this bigger prey. And, uh, so in the previous one, we see that it was a positive effect, or at least with this species, it was a positive effect with an endangered species. But what happened uh, when we have a toxin, uh, a toxic uh, prey? One example of this is the invasion of the cane toad in Australia, and how the presence of this uh, poisonous or toxic uh, prey has been associated with the decline of native lizards. Uh, all the way on to almost extinction or local extinctions in, uh, in Australia. And now we see here that this is a negative effect in a native uh, endangered species. Oh, I don't know what happened here. This is not the, the graph that was supposed to be here. <laughs> uh, but another example that we have is a little bit more complicated and it's when the, with the golden eagles. The golden eagles were able to colonize the islands in the channel of California uh, due to the inclusion of feral pigs. 
And since the Feral Pigs uh, were, were released in those islands, the Golden Eagle have more prey to, to feed on and actually establish a population in the, in the islands. But that was, uh, we say like, oh, it's good, Golden Eagle is, 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 is in danger. But also, what happened is that the Golden Eagle was also preying on meso carnivores that are endemic to the islands, and those endemics were being pushed towards extinction due to the predation by the Golden Eagles. So when we see a positive effect in one species, that doesn't mean there is a positive effect in the whole system. So as a case study, study uh, I've been working with the uh, invasive armor catfish. It's native from the uh, Amazon basin, and it's, it's, a, it's really hard to tell apart from species. So I just uh, call it as a group of species, uh, as armor catfish, but they could be Pteroglyptis pardalis or Pteroglyptis disjunctivus. And as far as we know now, the only way to distinguish them is in the, in the patterns of their uh, coloration in the belly. But uh, this is, these two look like they could be like different species, but they actually were captured in the same unit, in the same day, in the same, uh, they were together in the same uh, unit. Okay. okay. And this species in 2005 was reported to have an established population in Tabasco, in southeast Mexico, in the water mouth of the Usumacinta River. And this is probably due to uh, farms that were having uh, that species for uh, aquarism, because it's a species that is highly used in aquarism. So in 2005, the uh, our established population was reported in. Uh, in the, water, uh, water, in the river mouth of the Sumacinta River. Two years after that, I found a specimen in Guatemalan uh, territory that, uh, that is in the headwaters of the river. In a tributary of the Sumacinta, it's in San Pedro River. So in just two years, uh, it uh, swim all the way up to the, to the headwaters of the rivers. And as native predator, I'm using the Neotropical River otter. That is a, a small size, uh, no, a medium size a carnivore that ranges from North Mexico to Northern Argentina. And its main prey are fish. And when they're overlapped in distribution with the armor catfish, the armor catfish or the group of armor, armor catfish are the main prey. So it's like interesting that, uh, to see that how this species is uh, interacting with them when they were not, uh, present before. So what's in my question? Uh, the niche breadth and tropic level, level of the Neotropical River order uh, has been changing due to the inclusion of the armor catfish in their diet. I'm not going to talk about trophic level here to keep it a little bit simple, only about niche breadth. Uh, well, niche breadth is a measure of diversity and the diversity of diet. And uh, we can have the same richness of prey, so the same uh, different types of prey, but if a uh, predator is focusing or consuming in more proportion one species, uh, the niche breadth or the diversity will drop. And we can use, uh, we can do this uh, to two techniques. One is just going through SCAS, uh gut content or uh, DNA in, in, in excretions to see which uh, prey are they having. What I did here, and also the other one is using stable isotopes. What I use is uh, SCATS and stable isotopes in SCATS. Uh, so I'm going to explain. Well, going through the, through the SCAT, I did bonds and scales of fish. And with the stable isotopes, what are stable isotopes? Stable isotopes are uh, the same uh, element, atoms of the same element, but have different number of neutrons. So that means that they will have a similar chemical uh, characteristics, but one will be heavier than the other one. And the heavier one will take longer to react due to, the, to its weight. So this is used to, to distinguish it, uh, between them and also because uh, the, the difference in reaction, that will mean that uh, when an animal is excreting uh, they, they're, uh, due to metabolism, it will excrete faster, the lighter, um, the molecules that have the lighter uh, atom or isotope. Normally, uh, for trophic studies, uh, we use um, nitrogen and carbon. 
and they are measured uh, due to this proportion of the proportion of the heavy and the light one in relation to a, a standard and they're expressed in per meal. Okay, so with nitrogen, we know that there's this uh, enrichment of the heavy one when uh, the tissue goes from one trophic level to another trophic level due to the fast reaction of the, of the light isotope. So when we go to a, a higher uh, trophic level, it will be more concentration of the heavy one. And we can see here, like, what happened if a predator only preys on this one? It will have uh, a little bit more concentration of, uh, of, the, of the nitrogen. And they say that there's an increase of about 3.4 per meal for trophic level. So a predator that preys on this one will have this. A predator that preys on this one will have these values. And we will say that this predator is a specialist on those preys. But what happened if we have a, a third predator that preys on both types of fish? Its, trophic, uh, its uh, values of nitrogen will vary a lot because it's, it's integrating tissue from different trophic levels. And to, in order to estimate the, 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 the dietary width or the, 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 the niche breadth of the diet, we don't care much about the values of the uh, isotopes, but we care about the variance. So we will say that a predator that variates a lot like this one is a generalist and the one that has a more uh, or different measures from different specimens have more close related values is a more specialist species or group or population. Uh, in terms of carbon, there's no, this process of enrichment is called fractionation. This process doesn't go, uh, it doesn't have much, much enrichment in terms of carbon. The carbon uh, values are more uh, based on which plant actually fixated the, the carbon from the atmosphere. And uh, uh, we say that the C3 plants have lower values of, of, uh, of isotopic uh, carbon and uh, aquatic plants will have an intermediate and C4 plants will have a less negative values. And the same here, we will say that uh, a species that's consuming different types of plants will have a wider variance. Meanwhile, a one that is specific of one type of plants is has uh, a lower variance. And the same will go with the, the predators that prey on those, uh, on those uh, herbivores. Okay, so what we did, uh, we started sampling in 2009 in San Pedro River and La Pasión River, and we then go back in 2015, and we included a river that is, doesn't have the, the invasive. The, these two rivers are outside of protected areas, and San Pedro River is in the frontier of uh, Laguna del Tigre, a national park that is uh, the biggest uh, wetland in Mesoamerica. And uh, we collected 286 scans uh, distributed in this, uh, this way. We separated the scans that have uh, some contamination from some external material, and we don't include those in the isotope values, but we did include those for the uh, gross scat analysis, because for the gross scat analysis, we just have to see the, the bonds. Uh, we don't care much about the, the uh, isotopic values. And we get, uh, with the gross scale analysis, 35 uh, scale fish species, including three invasive, that includes tilapia, carpa uh, is trout, I think, and uh, the, of course, the armored catfish. We also found uh, one more for species of native catfish, uh, identified insects, uh, identified reptile, identified mammal, identified crab species, and one crayfish. In terms of richness, with the Passion River, the one that is outside protected area and has in the, the, the armor catfish, we see there is a tendency of reduction of richness, but uh, this, is, this is not significant. We don't see that tendency in uh, San Pedro River that is inside of the protected area. We think that this uh, difference might be that there's some type of uh, resilience in, in, in that the protected area or the integrity of that system uh, is given to, to, 
to the community. When we analyzed the three rivers uh, that were sampled in the same uh, year, there's no difference. And uh, we have to point out here that the Mopan River, that well, it doesn't have the, the, the basic fish, is also a smaller, smaller river. So it's going to be that important in the next slide. Here. And uh, okay, we see that the niche bread using gross cut analysis uh, has a, a big decrease in La, in La Pasión River, the one that is outside protected areas. And we don't see that a strong decrease. There's a, a decrease, but not that big in San Pedro River. And we find that Mopan River is in a, in, in, in a, in a middle value, even when it doesn't have the basic. But this could be explained that because it's a, a smaller river, and it's expected to have less diversity. And also is outside a protected area, so it has lots of uh, human uh, impacts. Uh, with the frequency of consumption of the armor cut fish, I don't include Mopan here because there's no there's no presence of the fish, the basic fish. We see that there's increase in the consumption of the of the fish between two years after the invasion and seven years after the invasion. And once again, the uh, Passion River has a stronger uh, change, going from a uh, sixteen percent to almost fifty percent, something like that. And in the, in, the, in the initial of the invasion, there, there were not that difference between each other. In terms of stable isotopes, we see that there is a decrease in the, in the niche breadth of, uh, of the order, but the, the decrease is stronger in, in San Pedro River. So we can think like, oh, but this is, the, this is not the same tendency that we were seeing with the cross scatter analysis. But what this can mean is that probably uh, the it's not the, the, the diversity uh, per se of, uh, of rates that are uh, less uh, decrease in La Pasión River, but what it means is that probably in La Pasión River, due to high impact of, uh, of humans, the high trophic level uh, rates were already depleted. So even that there's similar diversity in gross scat analysis, the type of prey is different due to higher previous impact, previous day, independent to the, to the invasion of the armor catfish. In terms of carbon, uh, this is, once again, we think about that this looks opposite, like because we see an increase in the niche spread. But this could be because the armor catfish may be able to take advantage of more resources than the native uh, herbivores and uh, vegetables. And in, in that way, increasing the niche breadth in terms of carbon because uh, it's including more nutrients for different uh, plant sources. Okay, so as a conclusion from uh, this part of my master's is that the niche breadth of the orders was uh, narrower seven years after the invasion than two years after the invasion. And the lower intensities of the changes in Passion River may be to some type of uh, a resilience due to the conservation of the area. So what's next? Uh, okay, so after we see this, we start like thinking, okay, how can we explain actually what's happening? Because that was like, okay, there's, we know there's something happening, but what that means for the whole community. And uh, so we need to evaluate the, if the consumption of the armor catfish actually means something for the populations of the, of the otters or the other predators, as it's meaning uh, here with the uh, snail kites. And, uh, and there's, is, is the, the inclusion of the armor catfish is actually changing the dynamics between uh, human and predators conflicts. So what uh, we're planning to do if we can uh, find the findings for the PhD, <laughs> it will be uh, to see if there's a effect in the diversity of predators in the population size and survival of the base fish, and in the other directions too. If the population size of the armored cat fish means something for the survivor and population size for the predators. And um, what are the, we're also, like, because these, these fish I have found are, are more associated to human impacted areas. 
So that could be attracting the predators that uh, they were not uh, going that way, that, that place before, or uh, subsidizing uh, a bigger population there, which can also mean an increase of negative interactions with humans. So is that happening? Is that true or not? So uh, for my first question is like, uh, does the diversity of the, of, the, of the predators actually mean something for the, to keeping in check the populations of the armor catfish? And uh, we plan to estimate the diversity of the, of the community of predators and relate that to survival and uh, abundance of the armor catfish. And we expect to have uh, a negative relation. Uh, in real life, this is not gonna be a straight line, right? But it's just to, to give an idea what we are expecting. And to do that, we are gonna divide the system in uh, portions of 10 kilometers uh, of length in, across the, the shoreline and randomly choose uh, a proportion of them. And in, in, in each sample that we have chosen, uh, estimate the diversity of the predators using line transects for birds and crops, uh, gill nets for fish, uh, also lines and hooks for fish, scans for otters, eDNA for fish and others to increase some of the uh, detection probability. And we will uh, estimate the diversity using uh, occupancy models. And there will be, the repetitions will be done uh, especially, not, not especially, not in, in time. So we will divide our block of 10 kilometers in, in different segments and we will sample on each of those and uh, to have our repetitions of occupancy. Uh, then to see if the armor catfish means something for the predators, we will choose the, the predators who are more abundant in the area and that consumes in high amount the, the, the invasive fish. As a priority, I have chosen these three species, but they can uh, change based on the results that we have from the first part. And uh, so I'm thinking about the, the river otter, the neotropical gar, and the neotropical cormoran. Uh, then I hypothesize that the population structure of the predators would be defined by the, the armor catfish. And ha as a prediction, having a, a positive relationship, like as bigger uh, populations of the invasive uh, fish will have bigger populations and bigger, uh, uh, bigger survival rates in, uh, in the predators. To do this, uh, we will divide our system in pieces of 100 uh, kilometers uh, long in the, in the shoreline using only first and second order rivers. And along those uh, rivers, we'll sample for three years uh, to estimate the size and the survival of uh, the population and each uh, age class. For cormorants, uh, we're planning to capture it in the, in the roosting areas during night uh, to uh, mark them with individual bands in the legs, uh, divide them in three different ages and sex uh, being the, uh, uh, defined by DNA. And uh, we will have the survival through three, three years. For others, um, we will be identifying individuals through DNA in stats and to three, uh, three years. We are not gonna be uh, to able to identify ages here because DNA doesn't tell us the age, right? Only sex and individual. And with the uh, tropical guard or tropical guard, we will have, um, we'll sample the using illness and, and, <clears throat> and hook and line, and we will estimate the, the age through auto lights and uh, the, the reproduction of the sex through gonads and we will see the, the survival rate in uh, for each sampling because we have like age classes so we can have like a different uh, survivor through, through only, only one um, shot screen and we will also have it through, uh, we will repeat, repeat this in three different years. We will not have survival of the same fish for the next year because we will sacrifice each fish that we capture. 
in terms of uh, with human interactions, well, the as I was saying, like the presence of the invasive fish can actually attract predators, and that can mean uh, a negative interaction with humans. And uh, I emphasize that as more uh, probability of encounter of the of the predator it will be a less animosity towards the uh, to the predators. And uh, we will have like my prediction is like this: uh, as more more predators are being encountered by by humans, they will have uh, uh, a, a worse perception of them, and a negative uh, also uh, it will increase the probability of negative interactions. Uh, we'll estimate this by doing interviews. Um, the species to interview which people will be chosen randomly, since we are talking about. Uh, Roughly of 30 or uh, I mean 40 uh, different predators or probably predators. This list can uh, be decreased after the what we our results from the first part. And uh, we will ask about knowledge of the species, uh, how they feel about the species, and if they have a previous encounter, if it was a negative, positive, or uh, it doesn't matter. And uh, we will have three different treatments. There is uh, villages inside and outside of uh, protected areas and bigger towns. We will divide our river in terms of uh, 50 kilometers. This can change uh, if also depending on uh, the, the action range that each community has. So we will, inter we will ask also in the interviews how far you go to, to do fishing, uh, or how far you go to buy something when, when you are taking the, the, the a boat. And uh, we will define that uh, that 50 kilometers as a sampling uh, unit, and we will do also uh, occupancy models, uh, having the repetitions to be the different interviews to estimate the probability of finding the, the predator and having a positive or negative uh, interaction with, with them. And let's work hard, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Questions?